I know. I'm Eleanor McNish. I am an artist and I live in New Mexico. And this is my first video for my YouTube channel that I created a long time ago and have never uploaded anything to. Um, I'm a silversmith. I'm a glass bead maker. I teach classes in metal clay. And I also love to do a lot of other things and needlepoint is one of them. So some women in my neighborhood wanted to learn how to do needlepoint. And so I put together this sampler coaster for them to teach them to needlepoint. However, COVID-19 happened. And so now we can't get together for more lessons for the time being. And I thought that we could all do the lessons online. And since it's YouTube, anyone who wants to can follow along, which is kind of cool. So if you are not in my needlepoint group and you would like to make this, the materials will be, a list of the materials will be in the first video, all of which are available on Amazon. You can do it on a scrap of canvas. This is 14 count needlepoint canvas. Um, you can also use plastic canvas, which is this, also available on Amazon. Um, it's 14 count plastic canvas, so it's, it's actually, I think, better than regular needlepoint canvas for this because it doesn't warp. And as you stitch it, you can see that this is already coming out a little bit because mine is not on a frame. Um, so this, the plastic canvas, it doesn't warp and the edges are self-finishing because you just whip stitch the edges and then you just glue a piece of felt to the bottom. So you don't need to block it and you don't need to turn over the edges and deal with that. So, you know, um, it also uses embroidery floss available on Amazon, um, and a needle. So there you go. Um, what else? Oh yeah, my daughter and I have been working on um, some other needlepoint projects, just trying stuff because we're, you know, kind of bound to our house. And um, so I figured out how to make a needlepoint baseball cap with your initials and signal flags across the top of the cap. So that will be my next video. And that also just uses a baseball cap, embroidery floss, a needle, and a permanent marker. So, um, if any of those things sound interesting to you, follow along. And the first set of videos is going to be this coaster, which is now being called the Quarantine Coaster, since we're all working on it from home. All right, so that's about it. So this is the quarantine coaster <clears throat> and it's something we can all do together and it's really fun. And guess what? It is on plastic canvas. So this is something that um, a company named Doris makes. They make 14 count mesh canvas. <clears throat> when uh, my needlepoint, my neighborhood needlepoint group, when we first started um, this project, I made canvases for everybody that looked like this. And, um, you know, they're great, but they're a normal uh, needlepoint canvas. And that can be tricky to finish on your own. And so um, I thought that for this YouTube follow along, um, I would use um, plastic canvas because I love plastic canvas. It's one of my favorite things to use because it's self-finishing. There's no, you know, you just cut off the end and you whip stitch the edge and you're done. You just glue it to a piece of um, felt. Usually plastic canvas looks like this. I love this coaster. This coaster is one that my daughter made for me when she was about seven years old. So of course I love it. It's one of my favorite things. Um, but as you descend in size with plastic canvas, it becomes, it looks less like plastic canvas and more like regular needlepoint canvas. So this one is, I think, 
16 count maybe. Um, and you can see it's starting to look more like traditional needlepoint. This one is, or no, sorry, this is not 16 count. This is probably mm, 12 count. And then you get into the 14 count, which is what our coasters will be. And you just literally, you can't tell the difference. Or if you can, it's amazing. I can't tell the difference. Uh, this is pearl cotton. It's called pearl cotton. It looks a little bit like a rope. And um, it's available at Hobby Lobby and um, Michael's and Walmart and all of those great places. And Needlepoint and um, Needlecraft stores. Um, it's kind of shiny and very nice. The kind that Joann's and um, Michael's and Hobby Lobby and all those guys sell is this size. And this size is um, size five. And you can get it larger um, and that's a size three, but I don't have any of that. So I'm making do with what I have because I, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. Okay. And this is embroidery floss. It's comprised of six little threads. And um, the uh, when you get it, the DMC is very nice. And it is, um, it has a short, a short label on one end that says DMC, and then it has a long label on the other end. This fortunately is sticking out, but if this weren't, and many times they're not, um, many times it'll be like right here. And there's two ends, right? There's an end right here, and there's also a little cutoff end somewhere around here. So when you're dealing with DMC, you wanna make sure you pull it from the label, the end that has the long label on it, and then it will pull out without creating a big knot and mess on your um, skein, which is great. So it's a good thing to know. And if you're dealing with cheaper, this is, um, let's see, this is from uh, Walmart. Um, but there's a company called Iris that, um, that Hobby Lobby carries and it's the same. They, um, they usually will make their tails kind of long. So just to give you a clue of where to start pulling, which is very nice. Okay. So since we're doing this on plastic canvas, I'm going to really kind of focus on that. Um, the, if, if you want to make a traditional if you want to make one on a traditional canvas, it is 14 count. Um, and you need about this, this coverage is doubled up two strands of embroidery floss, two full strands of embroidery floss. And it, it gives great coverage. I've found that the best coverage for plastic canvas is, um, 1.2 and I make little samples for myself as notes so I can remember what I did. And 1.2 to me means that it is one piece of embroidery floss plus two individual strands of the same or a different color added to it to get me to the point where I'm happy with the coverage. So, and it's the same with the pearl. The dark olive is a um, piece of pearl cotton with two strands of um, olive uh, embroidery floss. Okay, so the embroidery floss is six little strands. Um, and it is, you just tap it and you grab, you grab the whole thing with one hand and then you grab one single strand with the other and you pull. and it doesn't knot up. It's so great. If you were to take these and pull like this, pull away, um, it would, if you try to do it like this, you will get a knot. It is, it, it is a sure, sure thing. So don't do it. Just, just do this. So <clears throat> it is, um, it's very tempting 
to want to um, pull two at a time to save time, but that too will produce a knot. So just, you know, just sit there and methodically do it. It's okay, you'll get through it. Um, also, you will have a lower chance of um, this thread knotting as you're working with it and pulling it through the canvas if you um, if you keep it to fairly short lengths, if you work with fairly short lengths of about a foot to, I don't know, 12 to 13, 14 inches. Um, <clears throat> if you work with really long pieces of thread, it will not. I wanted to also tell you about how I do shading kind of things. And I, I think it makes for a more interesting piece and it just doesn't look so flat. You know, it's not just so, I don't know, so this background, this border actually, is mosaic stitch. And it is comprised of one piece of this pearl cotton. It's kind of a light, mm, sort of slate blue, kind of, I don't know. Um, and then it has two, of, two threads of this kind of dark sea foamy green looking things. So it's one piece of pearl and two individual strands of this make, get this effect. Um, the Hungarian stitch, this, this light purple, I think you can see, see how it has a little, um, a little bit of pink that runs through it. It's because I've taken two strands of this color and used it with this color. And then this pink is just straight one strand of embroidery floss plus two individual strands of embroidery floss of the same color as is this. So this is the only one that's shaded. Um, this Nobuko is pearl, olive colored pearl cotton and um, two strands of olive, uh, two individual strands of olive embroidery floss. Okay, and these little dots, this is the um, Nobuko, Nobuko um, breakdown stitch where you do it in two separate stages. So this color is this, okay? Um, but I'm Oh, and the, the E is um, this variegated thread I got at Hobby Lobby. And I love variegated thread because it's always a surprise at how it's going to turn out because it looks like I kept changing um, thread colors, but I didn't. I just kept stitching and the thread changes color <clears throat> as it's um, as it's used. Okay, it's changing, changing. So um, some people don't like it. I love it because it's, I don't know, I just think it's kind of fun. And then this, this, these little guys I did in something out silk lame braid, which if you don't have it right now, it, you it will probably have difficulty finding it because I don't know who sells it online, um, who is actually open right now. But you can use, you know, you can use anything. You can use any kind of embroidery flat. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Just, we'll all get through it and we'll learn things in the process for, for, um, from using what we have, I think. So we're going to start with the letter. And you can do this letter in um, uh, in basket weave, or you can do it in continental stitch because it's just not that big of a, um, it's not that big of a, of an area. So if you were doing something like this whole thing, in continental tent or this, or, you know, you would get a lot of warpage, um, particularly on something like this. Uh, one of the great things though, I gotta tell you, one of the great things about plastic also is that it, um, it doesn't warp. What it does do, if you have, if you are stitching too tightly, like if you have, if your thread is too large for the size mesh you're working with, it will start to bow. It'll it'll start to 
go like this and go like this, which is why I like that one strand of pearl cotton or one strand of um, embroidery floss plus two individual strands is the sweet spot for this 14 mesh. Um, so, um, and if, if you're using a different fiber and it ten and it does bow to the point where you're like, mm, it needs to lay up a little bit flatter, just take two pieces of parchment paper and sandwich this in between, um, a couple pieces of parchment paper and take an iron on medium setting and just kind of go like this, take off the iron peak, see if it's calm down. If it hasn't, do it again. For in like mm, maybe five second cycles, just with your iron, just go brum, 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 brum. And then when um, when it's calmed down a little bit, put it under a book on a table um, or countertop, flat surface, and leave it until it cools down. And when you take it off, it'll be absolutely flat as a board. So that is also a really wonderful thing because you don't have to block it like you do with regular needlepoint. All right, uh, so we are going to these. This is a number 20 tapestry needle. Tapestry needles are, um, they are not sharp. They are made for, they are made specifically for this kind of thing so that they do not pierce the, um, the thread and they don't pierce the canvas. So um, there's embroidery needles also known as cruel needles, and they are quite sharp, but these are not. Let me put the needle on. And then either one works, and you know what else? You can also use a, um, a piece of paper as long as it will fit in the eye of your needle. You can hmm. there we go. I guess this should have made it a little bit narrower. But you know, there's just all different kinds of ways to thread your needle. Or you can um, just do it the traditional way, which is what I do because I tend to lose these little thingies. Um, if you grasp it right and you, the end just peeks up over the, you can just barely see it. And then you just wiggle your needle down in there. Okay. So I prefer it this way because I think it's easier, faster, and it's less to keep track of. All right, so when I start, I start with a piece that is way too big, right? Because I'm gonna estimate the center of this. And if I'm off, it's not gonna matter unless I am way, 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 way off. So, um, I start with some with a larger one, and then when I get close to the edge, I cut the edges off. Okay, so in the um on my website, my blog website, which is lifetart.com. And if I can fit it into the um, verbiage below this video, I don't really know how to do it, but I'm gonna look at how to do it. There's a link to um, this website. So it's run by, it's the work of a guy named Joss, or Joss Hendricks. Um, and he takes, uh, he takes um, computer fonts and he um, converts them for <laughs> cross-stitch and needlepoint. I love this man. He's so wonderful. And it's free. And he has all of them there. And you can download them as PDFs on your computer. You can print them out. You can do whatever you want with them. So um, I'm working on the E, right? So 
this is really for cross stitch. So cross stitchers would put an X at each one of these X's, right? But we're using it for needle points. So each one of these X's is equal to the intersection of canvas threads when you're using it for a needle point, okay? So the, um, <clears throat> so when you look at this, right, each one of, so this, you have to imagine this is a canvas thread that runs in between each of these holes, vertically and horizontally, right? This blank space is what is equal to a canvas thread on a canvas, right? Canvas threads going up and down and the intersection and the holes, right? So you just, it's the same thing here. It just looks a little bit different. There's four holes and in between four holes is an intersection, okay? So <clears throat> this letter is 510. This is 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. 17 high and nine right. wide. So um, we are going to tie a waist knot. Now this center E can be done in um, continental or basket weave. Okay, so we need to tie a little knot this is called an inline waist knot because it's in the line of where we're going to start. So we are going to start at the front on the front. And we know that this letter is nine wide because we're going to count while we're, we'll count while we're stitching as well. As well. Sorry, that was out of the camera. So we've got a knot here and we came up right here. Right? Okay. Okay. So I'm going to start this as a basket weave or I'll start it as 10 and then we'll move to basket weave and you can choose at the end of this section, which you want to do. Okay, so continental stitch is coming up in the lower, in a hole and um, going to the upper right of it. So crossing over, so from here to over here, right? Crossing a canvas intersection. So that you cross one canvas intersection and you are Okay. All right. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, we've got three more. One, two, three. Ah, so perfect. Okay, now we're gonna pull this and cut it. Right. And now on the back, it's buried in this tunnel that we've created by the stitching. Okay, so with continental stitch, if I wanna go back this way, I need to rotate the canvas and then do the same thing. Start in the lower, lower left, and in the upper right. Okay. And another thing I love about plastic canvas is that regular um, needlepoint canvas that you're working in the hand, like this. Um, I can't put a needle minder on this, so I have to. 
put it in the canvas itself um, when I put it down and to change thread. And with um, plastic canvas, it's stiff enough that you can do it. You can use it. Which is great because they're really helpful little things. So it's like it's it's terrifying. <laughs> it's terrifying to lose a needle and not know where it is, but know that there is one floating around. <laughs> I'm like, oh no. Okay. I've gotten to the end of this row. Also, if your um, thread your thread will start to sort of twirl and twist up you know, and that creates knots. So just every once in a while, just go like this at a quarter turn or hold it and let it spin out, you know, hold it and let this, hold it up higher, but you know, and let it spin out to let it work out its issues. Okay, all right. So we're just gonna keep doing this. Okay, so, oh. Okay, here we go. See how there's like, there's a little knot and I'm kind of pulling. On this kind of canvas, well, you're not really supposed to yank out knots anyway, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's tempting and most people do it from time to time. However, on plastic canvas, you do not want to do that because you will break the plastic. So that's, not the greatest thing. If you happen to break the plastic, if you break a big, like if it rips a big hole, hmm, it's maybe not the greatest thing. But if it just rips one or two intersections, it's really not that big of a deal because you can just stitch it like you regularly, like you would, um, and just don't pull very hard and keep stitching. And once you get past it, all the other stitches um, we'll anchor it in place and it will, you'll never, you would never know that you had one. So it's not like traditional canvas where you have to patch it with another piece of canvas. You, um, unless you have a big, you know, gaping hole, then you're good to go. Okay. So that is the continental stitch. Now let's look at our E. So we've gotten the first top bar of the E done, right? It's three stitches down and nine stitches that way. So we've completed this part. So now I need to go here and it's three wide. So I know if I start on this side edge, right there, and go, actually, sorry, I went the wrong way. So another thing with um, canvas, <laughs> plastic canvas, that you can, it lets you break rules that you couldn't break with regular needlepoint because what I just did by putting it in this way and then flipping it, if I did that on a regular canvas, it, it wouldn't work out because I would get a traveling shifting thread. Okay, so now we're going to go down, right? So now I'm going to show you the basket weave stitch. So the basket weave stitch is, it's all diagonals, right? It's, it's just a zigzag of diagonals. It's like going up and coming down and going up and coming down. Um, it is, everyone has trouble when they're learning it. I had trouble every, I have like basket weave flashbacks. It's like, it's kind of stressful because you can't understand what's going on and you don't know what you're doing wrong. So um, on this particular uh, um, project, it really doesn't matter. You don't have to do the basket weave if you don't want to. So don't worry about it. Okay, so now I'm in a position to go diagonally by adding those stitches. Okay, so I'm gonna go right here. And then I am, um, I need, now I need to come down here and to be able to do that, I need to hop over, right? So I'm gonna hop over right here. And 
now I can go down. The basket weave stitch is the most widely used stitch in needlepoint. And one of the things that is really wonderful about it is that when you're making something like as an upholstery kind of um, thing, like a bench seat cushion cover or, you know, pillow even, um, you use basket weave because it makes it into just this really tough, heavy duty textile. Not plastic canvas, obviously. You don't, you can't use plastic canvas for pillows and stuff like that because the stress from the edges, you know, of where it's attached to the fabric or whatever, it's, it's, you know, it's too much for it. But for, for square ornaments, I prefer it with using it with straight lines, but, um, straight edges, but, uh, ornaments and coasters, it is fan. Fantastic. And my daughter uses it to make patches for her jean jackets. And um, you can, you know, cut little things out and make little patches and sew on a pin back onto the back. And it's, it's really great stuff. Okay, so now I'm down to the end of my row, right? And I'm gonna do the hop. It's right there to go up. But I need to find out how far down the um, the bar is. So this one, two, three, three spaces in between um, the this and the bar. Now spaces is not holes, it is intersections. Remember, it is canvas intersections. So you have to count down intersections. So it's supposed to come out right here. And the way that I looked at that is I just put my needle up and I'm like, okay, from right here, that's one, two, three. Okay. So now I'm on track. So I need to go here and it is equal to over here. So I'm just going to come over here and do that. Right, and uh, it's starting in the same line as this one above it. So I know that's correct. And there's room for one, two, three stitches. Yep, that's correct. So we're gonna do a little bit of basket weave to get the bar completed. And it is three thick as well. So when you go to Jaws, Joe's, I think he's a Dane, or he's Swedish, or he's somewhere in that area of the world. Um, when you go to his website, um, this, this particular uh, letter font is Century Gothic Bold. The bold is very important. The regular Century Gothic is just, it's just a little bit skinny. It's like not, there's not enough oomph to it. Oops, I forgot. Did I? Nope, I was forgot. Yep, I did, I forgot a stitch. So. Again, great thing about plastic is even though I forgot a stitch, I'm just gonna go in and throw it in there. No biggie. All right, so now we're coming to the end of this thread. So we're gonna talk about burying a thread, which is how to end a thread and also how to start a new thread if you choose not to start your new thread with a waist knot. And okay. So do you see the difference? This is all continental, right? And this is basket weave. And it is just so 
it's a huge difference. Also, this is a good illustration of why Continental, see it, all those stitches are going the same way. And what that does is it creates a lot of tension on that canvas and it makes everything go that way. So your canvas goes, your canvas goes like this and it, and it will be like, end up looking something like that if you use only the tent stitch all over a canvas, which you would never do, but you might, if you didn't know you weren't supposed to, <laughs> it was gonna get all messed up if you did. So don't do that. Okay, so ending a thread is just, you. it's called burying the thread, right? And you put your needle through the back side and you pull it and then you cut. You're good to go. Now we're going to start the Noboku stitch, or I have, I have like a brain block on how to say that. I have no idea why I can't remember how to say it. Okay, so this is going to be, this is the olive, um, the olive pearl cotton and two strands, two individual strands of olive colored um, embroidery floss. Okay, and then we're actually just using one single strand. One single strand of pearl actually uh, really does cover pretty well if it is um, a short stitch and it is, um, if it's short and if it's diagonal. And if it is not, one piece of it is not going to work. And also there's the stitch chart on my blog that would be that will be enormously helpful because it's hand hand charted by me so see how there's one um one row right here and then so i know that there's one row up and then i start over here okay so one two three four on the fifth that's the center one row up and then this okay one. this is the nobuko stitch and i think it is easiest to um start this stitch uh by breaking it down to learn it for sure to learn it by breaking it down and it's so pretty when it's done in two colors and doing it in two colors kind of forces you to break it down so there's that okay so um we're going to find the center of the letter if your letter this is an odd number so it's easy to find the center. If you have an even numbered letter, um, if your letter is even numbered, then you're going to have to decide where your center is, but it'll just be off by one um, canvas thread, so it's you won't notice it, so don't, don't worry. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. There's my center. Okay, that's the center stitch right below where my needle is. I'm going to go up one, I'm going to skip that row and put a stitch in. From this first center stitch, it is including the first one you put in, it's seven over to the left, going to the left, okay? Skip one. Also, those little tag thingies are kind of a pain when you get your plastic canvas, make sure to clip them off because they get in the way. Okay. Um, so this row will be 13 long, but I know that it's seven from the center over this way. So that'll get us started. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, we'll skip. Six, seven. Okay, now we've got one more row um, above this, of this. So we just did from here over, and now we're gonna go up here. You'll notice too, 
these stitches are offset. So we just finished this stitch. We're going to come up here and this, see how these all line up and these guys all line up. So it's like ding, 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 ding. Okay. So when you're stitching this initial box of these light green <clears throat> stitches or whatever color you choose, um, you will notice on the edge, you'll get a zigzag. It'll go from here to here, to here, to here, to here, to here, to here. Um, and then we're going to fill in. Okay. And again, there's a very detailed explanation of that on the block. Okay. So I'm going to turn this over. Okay. So there's, we're going to skip this. We're going to skip this row right here. So we don't want them to touch. And if we did this one, it would end up right over here and they don't touch. So we know that that's not right. Okay. And we also know that it goes down the middle of this. So those first seven stitches, actually the first like couple stitches are the really the hardest part of the whole thing, because now it, um, it just is a natural thing. Let me skip. All right. Okay. I'm back. So I finished this row. And now I'm going to go catch up this row, right? So <clears throat> I know that each one of these is 13 long. Each one of these rows is 13 stitches long. Well, there are 13 stitches in this row. It's not 13 long because we're leaving gaps, right? So it messes with the actual length of the row. Okay, so this one is sticking out. And remember how we talked about how it's going to zigzag like this, right? So <clears throat> because this row is sticking out this way, um, that means on this side, it's going to come in, right? It's going to fall short of this instead of like this, because then it would be longer than 13. So just so that you know where to start, okay? Okay. I'm going to start here and not over here. Okay. All right. So there's that. And then um, because it's a it's a whole square. We're going to come in. I'm not going to do the entire thing on camera, but I will do a little bit down into the E as well because it's compensating stitches and we can learn about compensating stitches. Now it's going to zigzag, right? So that means this one goes out past the one above it. And then we're going to come in here. Get the zigzag, right? And now you see there's nowhere. I can't put it here because it's right next to this one. And we have to have a gap. And where it should go right here already has a stitch in it. So it's time to either go down here and start a new row or I'm going to just end the thread because I'm not going to actually stitch the entire coaster on a video for you. That would be really, really boring. <clears throat> All right. Now we are going to do the fill in stitch, <clears throat> which is the second part of this stitch. And I have my pearl with two individual threads of um, the floss. And thread my needle. All right, so it just gives it a little bit more fluff. And um, for whatever reason, you know, with plastic canvas, I think it's because the, the canvas holes are tighter, right? They don't, 
they're not spreading out like they do on traditional canvas, right? So when you look at traditional canvas, these, these threads move, okay? They move, they expand. So this obviously doesn't. So it's like, it's like putting something through a funnel and um, you need it to be able to splay out. And so by adding um, a cup, just a couple of strands, it really helps it do that and it helps with coverage. So that's why I do that. Okay, so the um, Nobuko, Nobuko <laughs> stitch is um, one thing that makes it so great is and so easy is that each one of these long stitches is bordered by a short stitch. It's like you just fill in the gap between short stitch to short stitch, right? So here's one short stitch, one short stitch, one long stitch. They butt up against each other and they share a hole. So, and it is three canvas intersections um, that you go across. So, um, where should we start? Let's start over here. Okay, I am also going to avoid, I don't wanna go in here because there's already a thread in there. And if I bury a thread like this and pull it through, it could potentially pull this out. So I'm gonna go into an area where there isn't any thread. Or you just tie a waist knot and um, start again. But with really long um, stitches that are not very tight, um, with things like that, you tie what's called in a waist, a way waist knot. And that is like putting it way far away and waiting until other stitches cover it up on the back. <clears throat> if your stitching is too loose or lacy. Okay, so um, I actually don't know what's down here because I haven't stitched it. So we're just gonna keep in this area. Okay, also these, the outermost um, edges of the stitches that stick out on the edges, that is the border of this square. So all of these are in line with all these long olive stitches are in line with these light stitches, okay? Okay, so I'm going to, since they share a hole, right? And we know that each long stitch has a short light stitch and um, on each end. I know that if I come up in this hole, and where can I go? I know that this is the border because this is one sticking out, so I can go right here. <clears throat> and that is called a compensating stitch because even though this stitch is supposed to cover three canvas intersections, it can't in this instance because there's not a run outside of the border. So you just make it shorter. Okay, so one, two, three, right? And that means, right, sure enough, there would be, um, there should be another green one right there, but there's not because of the zigzag thing. So one, two, three. Okay. Now we come over to this one. All right, sharing the hole, coming up. One, two, three, but I don't even need to count it because it's a straight shot. See? So it goes in a straight line and this one will block your straight line. There's nowhere else to go. So that is what makes this stitch so much fun and so easy to learn because once you know just some of the key things about it, you can't, you have no choice, right? To get past this stitch, you'd have to go over it and cover it up. So. It's just a straight line. So you don't even really have to count, except for when you're making compensating stitches, just to make sure you're, you know, kind of on the right track. Okay, and I just wanna make sure that's in a straight line, which is why I put my needle there. And also I could, because all of these guys are in the same line, I didn't even need to count. I could just 
like say, oh, well, it's going to be in this row because it matches the ones preceding it. All right. All right. Now, and quite honestly, I don't really know if I'm doing this right right now. And I just am in kind of a hurry, so I don't really have time to look it up. But I put the correct order of how you are supposed to stitch this on my blog. So, it is there for you. And you can avoid doing what I'm doing because I would assume that this is actually not the correct way. And it's good to learn the correct way because on plastic canvas you can do this, but you can't, you can't just go willy-nilly on regular canvas because of the traveling thread thing. So um, make sure that you check that out. So um, there's another, you know, kind of bare row. You can see all these guys, right? And then we need to fill this in. Right. So it's just another row. All right. And you just keep doing that all along until you have um gone gotten on the cube okay i'm back so the hungarian stitch the Hungarian stitch is the stitch that goes around this cube, okay? These little guys are put in after these are in, and they rest in um, gaps, that natural gaps that are left by the nature of this stitch. So we, um, we're going to wait to put these in until after all of this is done. Okay, so the way that I figure things out when I look at things like this is I look for some sort of a constant because all of these are constant, right? But where to start, it's just sort of a thing. But I can see that this, this stitch, this Hungarian set of stitches, you know, these three stitches, uh, the short one is absolutely level with the top of this cube. And <clears throat> so I am going to start there because I know if I start there, then I'm going to, you know, the spacing will be correct. And I don't have to count out a bunch of like how many intersections over because there it is. It's just very straightforward. So we're going to Bury the thread. And, oh, also, you know what? You can use cuticle scissors, like nail scissors, as little embroidery scissors. If you don't have any embroidery scissors, they can be kind of expensive. And if you're not super sure that you want to 
You're gonna to wanna to do this for a long time until you have done a little bit and you wanna to wait to buy scissors. Um, scissors like this are a, a great option. Okay, so it crosses over. Now see, it's a shared hole. You see that needle, right? So this stitch, this stitch ended in this hole, or this stitch did, ended in this hole. So it's going to share. Now, this stitch goes over two rows. So here's one row, and here's another row. On a regular canvas, it would be two threads. On this, it's a row of plastic. Um, and it covers one, the short stitch goes over two rows and it covers one hole. So there's my one hole. There's row one, row two, one hole. And they go in there. And it's again, a shared stitch. There we go. Okay, the long stitch is um, the bottom of it is diagonal from the short stitch. It's one row longer and one row top um, higher. So we go down here and up there, okay? Oops. And then we do another short stitch. Okay. <clears throat> so now that we have that in there, we can start, you can go vertically, you can go horizontally. Um, and the, actually those are your only two options. <laughs> so let's go vertically. So we're going to cover, um, the long stitch covers one, two, three, four, four rows and three holes. So one, two, three, four, and three holes. One, two, three. Covers up three holes. Now this stitch is, you can also, you can do the middle one first, you can do the little side ones first, it doesn't really matter. If you're working on regular canvas, it also doesn't matter, but you do need to be consistent. On plastic canvas, you don't have to be consistent with regard to starting with small or large holes. Um, this stitch actually, well, I don't know if it's easier, I guess. If you do it horizontally, it's really quite um, easy because you do this triple stitch and then you skip a row and that allows room for the one underneath it to nestle in to that space that's left. So these guys see how it skips and then this one comes in and takes up that room. So the, um, it skips one hole, sorry, not one row. It skips two rows and one hole. And once you have, um, figured out the, uh, the pattern, then you don't, you don't even have to count because you know this, the length of this is the same as this. So you just look over and see where this went in and came out and went in, okay? Also, can you see, see how you can see a bunch of canvas right there? Because this one got twisted and it's, so what you want, you want is, oh, here's my pasta example. Okay, so, thread going through plastic canvas is like this um, pasta. And it kind of, the plastic canvas, particularly pearl, 
Pearl does this anyway on its own. It just won't splay out. But um, embroidery floss, what you want it to do is you want it to go like this, right? To provide coverage for those canvas intersections, which is why we add, I add two strands of embroidery floss to Pearl to kind of give it some fluff on the side so it has better coverage. But that effect also happens with plastic canvas a little bit. And it happens with regular canvas too, but um, this is pretty obvious, right? So what we wanna do is we want, we're gonna take the stitch out and it is really useful sometimes to use a, um, a laying tool. And some people use laying tools all the time. Laying tools usually are um, used by people that are using frames. And I don't use frames that often unless I'm doing little ornaments that I don't have to, have to block. But because plastic canvas is kind of sturdy, um, you can actually use laying tools pretty successfully on it. Um, this is a laying tool. They're, they're pointed and they come, they're tapered. They, they're not super sharp, but they're sharp enough that they can like make holes bigger in regular canvas and things like that. So what they do is that um, they, they help to splay out the fibers and instead of the fibers looking like that, they go boop. So, um, but you can also use, like you could use a pen right, as a laying tool. You don't have to invest in a laying tool, especially at the beginning when you don't know if you want one, right? So, um, I mean, the laying tools, regular laying, real ones are, they're better, but you know, you can do just fine with a ballpoint pen. Just make sure the ballpoint pen part isn't, you don't want the pen out there. Okay. So, it just helps the those fibers to spread out, right? And you can kind of help it along by fiddling with it. Let me pull it down. So it's not fantastic because this one by the side of it is also a little um, twisted and tight. However, you know. It's okay. But just to let you know, there is a way if it's really bugging you. The other nice thing about this canvas, this plastic canvas, is that it's um, clear. And that helps a lot. So you don't see something white in the background, right? Because if you were to hold this up, like as a coaster over, um, gray felt, this will look just like it looks. It'll look fantastic. If you hold it up to the light, you can see see light coming through. And, you know, that happens on regular canvas too, but not to the extent that it happens on plastic canvas. But um, you could add a few more strands. You could use, you could not use, the real reason that happens is because we're doing vertical stitches. And vertical stitches, the coverage is iffy in any way. And um, when you do it on plastic canvas, then it gets kind of sketchy. So, um, but see how much, see how great the coverage is on the E and on the mosaic and stitch and all the other stitches. So a lot of it is just that it's a vertical stitch. But when you do it on canvas, you're usually doing it over painted canvas and the canvas beneath it is painted the same color usually as the thread you're using. So you don't really notice it or see it, but it, it, it's still there. Okay. So, using this, and this um, is on um, my blog so that you can refer back to it, and there's a stitch guide. So, uh, but this is three complete stitches wide, right? As is this, this entire row down this thing is three stitches, complete stitches wide, right? These are, this is two stitches and then part of the third, but these are three stitches wide. So, <clears throat> Oops. 
Okay. All right, I'm going to do some more of these stitches and then I'm going to come back and fill in the area around them. All right. Um, and I'll be right back. All right, so I got a couple more of these done. All right, so we're going to end the thread and we're gonna end the thread by burying the thread. Okay. another pre-done thread. So this is one um, one strand of embroidery floss plus two single strands of that strand, of another strand. All right, so we're gonna start it. Okay, so these are going to nestle in the spots. So this little bald area that is um, empty, right? This actually should be this pink stitch, the compensating part of this pink stitch. But because we, because I had a, added a border, we're gonna leave it um, blank. So leave these blank along the edges closest to the line and if you leave something blank that's not supposed to be blank, it's fine. You can go back and um, fill it in later on. No worries. Okay, so this, <clears throat> this hole that is right in the center because this covers two rows, you have a hole, it covers up one hole, right? And when you skip it, you expose that hole, you know, that's also right there. That is the beginning of the long stitch, the beginning and the end of the long stitch, right? So right here, right smack dab in the middle and right here. And um, this is, you know, so easy because you're just filling in the gaps, basically. All right, so you do this all the way down. Now, um, as I was making this, I ran out of this pink thread. So I, um, well, I didn't run out, but I really, I didn't have enough. I knew I wouldn't have enough to do the entire bottom. So I just switched colors. So I had enough of 
this, the first one we did this purple right here um, and did, you know, all around it, but then realized, oh, I don't have enough of the pink. And actually, I don't know, I think I kind of like it better. I think it's, I don't know, it's more interesting. And these also were all supposed to be the same color these sidebars of um, mosaic stitch and I, I just, I just kind of wondered what would happen if I made them all different colors. I am not so sure if I like that <laughs> better than all being one color, but I do like this um, sort of ombre looking effect. So, okay. So see, here's the gaps, right? There's a gap right there and there's a semi gap right there. If this were filled in, you'd see it. You'd see that it's a gap. Okay, so we're going to go fill that in. All right, now we are ready to do these little, these little guys, right? Okay, so these little guys are just they're about as simple as it gets. They cross two rows and one hole. Okay, so there is, there's the hole, okay. And they share a hole with this, the short stitch on either side of them. Okay. Okay. Now it's going to be really hard to come up and get in there, right? So you're going to come up in between these two long stitches like this. And then you are going to scoot that thread away with your needle and kind of feel around for the hole. I found it. There you go. There's one. Now I'll show you if it might be a little bit clearer without all that thread in the way. There we go. It's not there. It's actually underneath the yellow, the hole that we go into. Because if it were here, it would be a plus sign. It would be like this and this. But there, see that hole down in there? That's our hole. There we go. See? All right. Okay. So this, for the top one, this stitch extends and it it ends just to the left of this long stitch right just to the right of this second lime green and just to the left of this long one so we're going to go see where that hole is that hole is right here it's just to the right of the little lime and it's just to the left of this long olive okay and it's a shared hole and it's crossing over two rows, covering up one hole. And then we go look for the hole because it's underneath that guy. It's underneath our stitch. Okay. All right. So that is how you do those border stitches. And next, we are going to do a little bit of continental stitch and some mosaic and satin and then scotch stitch on the corners and we will be finished. Okay, I'll be back. All right, I'm back. So this is what we're doing next. This is the continental stitch. Um, the continental stitch, people have difficulty uh, 
turning corners with the continental stitch. Um, if it is like when you're going down like this, it's just da 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 da, no problem. And then you even when you go over this, it's no problem. But when you go down like this, um, your your last stitch went from here into here, so that when you turn your corner and you need to come up here or need to come up right here, that's a problem if you're using traditional canvas. Um, because you're using plastic, you don't have to worry about it. You can do anything you want. But a way around that when you're, just as a tip, the explanation for it is on the stitch guide in the blog. But um, you can, if you're using traditional canvas and you get confused about the order of, you know, dealing with the corners, you can do this to this and then stop, bury your thread and then start up here and do this and come do that row and then come down like that. And you will have accomplished the same thing without frustrating yourself, okay? So um, look at the stitch guide to kind of get a handle on corners because we're not gonna turn a corner here because I'm doing a, such a small area. Now this is one strand of pearl cotton and I don't have any, um, I don't have any little hair extension fluffers of embroidery floss in there. Um, but it's okay because uh, it's it's a diagonal stitch on um, on this canvas and the diagonal stitches, the coverage is really great like this. So you really don't need the fluffers if you don't want them for diagonal stitches. I'm also flipping this over because if I went at it like this, I would be trying to do this and that is, that's, that's hard. But if you flip it and come at it from the outside, the unstitched, then it's super easy because you can just push fibers to the side if you need to and they will lay on top of it. See? It was covering it like that and you just push it to the side, find the hole and So it's just like on the letter, on this center initial. Um, well, the first example, the continental stitch. And it's just the vertical of that. Okay, so it's just that over and over, up, around. All right. Okay. All right, the next stitch is the mosaic stitch. So I have my light blue. Um, mixed with the seafoam green, right? And it's this on the coaster. And I actually got this out because I think it might be easier for you to see what the stitch really is. So this stitch is a small stitch that crosses one um, intersection, a long stitch that crosses two intersections, and a small one that crosses one intersection. And it's just that over and over and over. And it's all these little boxes. And um, it's a great background stitch. It's quite effective. And it's really easy and it's fun. Okay, so we are going to do, again, there's a very detailed description of how to do this stitch with stitch guides with numbered, you know, things of literally every um, 
thing to do. Okay, so we're gonna make a short stitch that covers one intersection, right? There we go. And then we come up underneath that where we went in. We came up right here and went down right here. We're coming up underneath where we just came up with the previous stitch. And crossing two intersections and then coming down here to cross this last intersection. All right. You can do this in vertical rows. You can do it in horizontal rows going from here to here, here to here, drop down here to here. Um, you can, it's, it's, you can do it so many ways. So whatever is the easiest way for you is the way that you should do it. Oops, no yanking, remember. And then I'm actually going to cut this seafoam color out when I get this row done so that you can see um, what it looks like without that um, other color of fiber in there. We might even like it better, but it's just kind of interesting to see what, you know, what just adding one or two uh, fibers can do or how the overall um, end product looks. Um, also, because this is a diagonal stitch, you don't need, um, you really don't need to add any hair extension fluffer <laughs> embroidery floss because um, pearl cotton, pearl, pearl cotton uh, works quite well as a diagonal stitch all by itself on 14 mesh. Okay. okay. So I'm gonna pull this out. Just to see what it looks like now. Since this is a sample, I'm going to do this, but obviously you should not do this because it'll pull out on the front of the canvas <clears throat> on your stitched piece. So. And we don't want that because you worked so hard on it. I think actually I would prefer it with one floss of green embroidery floss, one strand of green embroidery floss, instead of the two I use. The two is sort of, I don't know, it's, I think it would be better if it was a little bit more of a subtle effect. So, I like it either way. All right, that is the um, mosaic stitch. And the um, in this stitch guide on my blog, which again is lifetart.com, um, it shows you where the compensating stitches are. And compensating stitches are small one or two intersection um, stitches that are out of order and they are difficult to see on this but I think they're in a different place on the stitch guide. Here they are. So this is correct but this is not correct and what it's doing is uh, oh actually yeah this is not correct and this is not correct 
right? But it's to make it so that this row starts and works. And then there are, nope. In the stitch guide for you guys, the other compensating stitches are up here. Um, mine are down here somewhere. So um, for that reason, do not checkerboard this in different colors because if you were to do this in like this where all of this is light blue and then these ones were dark blue, you would immediately notice the issue down here and up here where the compensating stitches are. And um, the way it is now, you don't. So don't, don't checkerboard it. All right, it is time for our last two stitches. So I wanted to show you with the scraps of the last stitch, I did a sample of um, satin stitch, which is the next stitch up in the thread from the mosaic. And I did it so that you could see why you're not supposed to use that <laughs> for really long stitches. Um, with no uh, fluffer. In fact, I really wouldn't even use it for this satin stitch anyway. There's just too much, you know, I don't know. There's just too much room showing. It works for the um, <clears throat> Noboku, but, uh, or no, Nobuko, yeah. Um, it works for this because there's all these other stitches in between that are like pushing in on it to keep those things together. But the satin stitch doesn't have those little insurance policies of stitches in between these long things. And so another, you know, ones that nestle in. So it's just not the greatest thing. So this is a strand of embroidery floss with two extra strands, one like piece of embroidery floss with two extra strands. Okay. So we're going to start it over here so you can see what a two two intersection satin looks like. And then we're gonna come down here and the what's in the stitch guide is a three intersection um, satin. And so we'll extend it down here so you'll see that too. Okay, so with satin, it's, it's the easiest thing in the whole wide world and it goes really fast. Um, you are just crossing two intersections, right? So you're covering up one hole and you're counting one, two, and going in. And then you don't have to count anymore because you're just following the line. If you just go into the hole right under it. All right. So nicely it covers because it splays out and lays flat. Okay, so let's do the three that's in the stitch guide. Okay. So if you prefer, you can make your border two if you like the two better. It's completely personal preference. See? So easy. Oh, please excuse Harriet. Oh, there's a truck outside. It's very, very upsetting to her. So uh, to prepare for the scotch stitch, this this satin stitch needs a um, a flat end. So um, all it is is descending stitches. So this covers three, now we're going to do two, and then one. And then we have a flat end, and we're ready for the scotch. All right, it's the last, it's the last stitch before we do the binding stitch around the edge. So it's very exciting. We've made it through together. 
Okay, so this is the Scotch Stitch. The Scotch Stitch is another really easy stitch and it's really fun. It's great for backgrounds and it's great for little punctuation marks like we're using it here as the little um, endings. So if you don't want, if you're uncomfortable with counting down this way because there's no, you know, sort of visual cues, you can absolutely start it over here. Okay, so it's one short stitch. So it's going to, one stitch is going to cross one, the first stitch will cross one intersection. The second stitch will go down and cross two intersections. And then the third stitch crosses three intersections. And then it's just the same as this. It just starts to descend again to make it into a square. Right. And think of it, if you think of it like you're building the sides of a box and the bottom of a box and the top of the box is right here. So um, it helps to know where your next stitch is because they're all in straight lines with the ones prior to them. See, there's a straight line. Here's, we're starting a straight line. This is a straight line. All right, there it is, Scotch Stitch. Fantabulous, yay. All right, so I'm gonna make another video about um, cutting the edge of this um, and binding the, um, the edges. And then when that is finished, you will have that. It's very exciting. So, all right. All right, when you have reached this point in your coaster, you need to whip stitch the edge of the plastic canvas. So um, you need to cut it um, and then you need to whip stitch it. <clears throat> so I've whip stitched part of this to show you um, what that looks like. And <clears throat> now I'm going to show you how to start your thread. So this applies whether right here or at the beginning, wherever, wherever you need to put thread in and start stitching. So it's very important that when you bury the thread that you, you position your needle where your next stitch is going to happen, which is right here, right? Um, otherwise, you will be able to uh, see some plastic canvas underneath it, or it'll peek through, and you don't want that. Okay, when you start, to whip stitch this, you're going to come, you're going to bury your thread, come up, and then you are not going to come through the hole and start to whip stitch. Uh, there's something about this that just makes it look not so great and you'll get gaps. But if you come through like this and then go like this, you will get a nice clean edge. Also, you can use your needle to kind of splay the fibers out. And you can also use your finger to um, sort of guide where you want that thread loop to go. There we 
we go. When you're cutting this plastic canvas, you want to cut as close to the top of the hole that you're cutting through, the row that you're cutting through, as close as you can without actually cutting into this plastic area right here. So if you can see, see how all of these have the little serrated tops which is part of the hole that was on the right hand side of this. So you want to not have, uh, have as little serration as you can manage, but you do not want to cut into the plastic above where that hole stops. So if you have a lot of really pokey outy kind of, you know, serrations like bum, 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 um, they will stick through, they'll poke through this part. And that's not what you want. But if you cut them so they're shallow, it's fine. When you get to a corner, I wanted to show you, See how the corner is rounded off? So I cut off the the sharp, you know, 90 degree angle of the corner. And that is because if you round the corner by just cutting off the, you know, 90 degree angle, this floss will go around the corner with nothing poking through like this. See how nice and covered that is? If you leave it at a 90 degree angle, um, the floss will either want to be on this side of it or this side of it, but you know, obviously it can't cover a sharp corner. So let's see. Let's see. Corners usually require um, two two passes through the same hole. And sometimes even three. And just be gentle when you're tugging so that you don't uh, break the plastic. And slow going. See how nicely that covered? And that is how you go around the corners. Okay, so. And you just need to whip stitch the entire edge. And I will be back to talk more about finishing up this coaster. Edge, and you're done, you just glue it to a piece of um, felt. You just sandwich it. <clears throat> you can take a regular coaster and glue that down in the tight areas of stitching so the glue has a little bit less chance to come through. And then you just glue down a piece of felt and you put little glue lines right along here and smush them together and do the next side and the next side and the next side and you're all finished and you have this great coaster. So. I was gonna to talk to you about um, this board because I've gotten questions before from people about it and I thought 
I would preempt any questions. This is something called a mag board that I make. It's on my Etsy shop that is not up right now during the coronavirus, but it will be back soon. Um, they are um, cork backed boards and they have magnets in them. And I made them for myself because I love to watch TV and needlepoint. And, um, and so with my legs crossed. So I hold this board um, in my legs and I can just throw my um, tools on it because, you know, they don't go anywhere. But because <clears throat> the magnets are on the back, it's easy to pull things off of them as well. It's not, it's not like a super, you could flip it over and it would be a very strong, but it's strong enough. You know, this is a box top from a, power charging box that I put, you know, and then I use it for doing calligraphy and I have a plastic cup that I put right here and I put a magnet in the bottom of it. That's why this is holding on. It's got a magnet in the bottom of the, um, of the, um, of the box. But, um, sometimes I'll put a cup and a bunch of pens and then I can sit and draw like that and just use the pen use grab pens out um scissor uh, it's it's absolutely amazing i love it so much and if i'm dealing with a lot of beading things i'll have little bead containers all stacked ding 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 across the top and my tools down here and nothing will come off and it's so great too because you can it's easy to put uh projects away if you need to take a break because you could just put the whole thing if all the boxes have magnets everything's going to be exactly the way it was when you put it away. So it's great. Okay. So back to this. Um, I'm a jewelry maker, so I make needle minders that have gemstones attached to them. This one is a citrine, and they are on my Etsy store as well, although not right now. Um, my Etsy store is Ellie Mac Mac, E L L I E M A C M A C. All right, so um, we are going to. And one more thing that I make is are these books. I wrote a little book about how to finish needlepoint ornaments. I didn't know how to do it. I wanted to know how to do it so I could finish my own ornaments because I am, I never make the stitching deadlines. It's just a thing. So I figured out how to make my own ornaments. And then I wrote a book so other people could make their own ornaments. And it's really easy and really fun. So, um, it is a full color book. It is 24 pages, I think. That's me. Um, and it's full color and it's got all the supplies and like not lots of nice close-up photos. It is, um, organized into sections so that, um, and then the sections are color coded. Right? So, there you go. All right.